Welcome to the Greater Portland Council of Governments 2024 Housing Summit. I am just so excited to see this crowd here today. I want to thank you all for making it here on this not so springy day <laughs> after a power outage. I appreciate all of you being here. I also want to thank the fantastic team at the Greater Portland Council of Governments. They not only put on this event, but they also launched a brand new resource for all of the municipalities that are here today, greatmainneighborhoods.org. So this is, the, this is the big day for all those resources, toolkit and success stories and lots of other goodies for you on that website. I want to thank our members, the cities and towns here who are working so hard on the housing issue. And I also want to thank our speakers who are all leaders in housing and can inspire us to do more. How many of you are from municipalities, elected officials, staff, or on a committee? Raise your hands high. That's great. Today is really for you. The purpose of the regional summit is for you to learn from each other and inspire each other. If housing were easy, we'd have enough. But housing is hard and complicated. We face a shortage today that's been in decades in the making, as you'll hear from Jeff Levine and Greg Payne today. It's also hard because change is hard. We love our communities, and we're afraid that new development will make us lose what we treasure. There are lots of points of view to consider, particularly when a specific development is proposed. I think of a good housing meeting or a zoning meeting as kind of like a Thanksgiving dinner with family. Everyone has an opinion on how it should be done, but we all end up talking about parking. <laughs> so jokes aside, even though housing is really hard, we need to welcome more homes in our region for all the people who need it, the seniors that are seeking to downsize, kids that want to come back to Maine to work and raise families, workers, including municipal employees like EMTs and teachers. This decade, we estimate that our region needs 24,000 new homes to address today's shortage and to meet tomorrow's workforce need. But more housing everywhere isn't the answer. Location matters. It really, really matters. In most places in our region, the easiest place to build, meaning the least amount of process and approvals, is on large lots in rural land. The hardest places are existing neighborhoods. In fact, many of the walkable villages and downtowns that we love in Maine could not be built under current rules. What I wish that all of us understood better is that when we say no to housing in existing neighborhoods, we're saying yes to housing in the natural areas, our farms, our forests, our fields, the places that make Maine so special. In Maine, we're fortunate that zoning rules are set by municipalities, giving local people the power to shape how their communities grow. What this means is that cities and towns have the tools to direct growth and to influence the design so the new housing can build on a neighborhood's sense of place. Cities and suburbs can add vitality to their downtowns and their villages that are already served by infrastructure, they're near school, they're served by buses, trains, and ferries. And small towns can encourage gentle density by nestling housing into existing neighborhoods. Many of this region's cities and towns have already done a lot in the first three years of this decade to move us towards that target of 24,000 homes by 2030. Some of you might be surprised to know that Bridgeton is one of our region's superstars. Where's Bridgeton in the house? Yeah. They are punching way above their weight, producing more housing per capita than any other town in our region. They had more than 400 new homes permitted in the last few years, and 10% of it's affordable. Portland took LD 2003 and really ran with it. Westbrook permitted the most new housing in 2023 with 300 homes and ha over half of them are affordable. West, uh, sorry, what Biddeford is steadily converting mills into homes and Yarmouth has nestled new homes into the historic village, blending in beautifully if you've seen it. I also want to offer shout outs to South Portland and Scarborough. In South Portland, a large share of new homes are affordable. And in Scarborough, the governor and I were both holding shovels this fall at the groundbreaking for Scarborough Downs. There are more than 1,000 homes that have been permitted there in the last three years, and a real diversity of homes for our families and for our workers. And the style is a walkable neighborhood, and you have accessibility to trails and to open space. It's a really neat, new New England village. Our region is doing a lot already, but collectively we need to average another 400 new homes each year 
um, it, it, more, 400 more homes since the amount that we've been doing in the last three years. So in other words, we need to do a little bit better than what we're doing right now, which is about 2,000 homes a year. And the leadership of cities and towns is absolutely essential to our region meeting its goals. We're here today to set the stage for more progress. We'll focus on what's working and lift up these successes. And we also have some new tools for you to take home. This morning, GPCOG launched a dashboard which shows how the region is doing against its goal and it has specific information on many of your communities. We also have on our website success stories that are there to inspire us all with Tom Bell who developed some wonderful videos you should take a look at. And also a toolkit that is really geared towards boards of selectmen and town councils. So you can take a look and easily see what are the tools you're using and what might you still use in the future. So we've been doing a lot at the local level and so is the state. And I am really, really glad to be able to welcome Governor Janet Mills to the podium. Governor Mills has been, yes, let's give her a round of applause. We'll give her two, we'll give her two. <laughs> Governor Mills has been a driving force for more housing in Maine. Her 10-year economic development strategy for Maine, released in 2019, called out the need to add 75,000 people to our workforce by 2030. And her administration has been a housing leader in Augusta, prioritizing and funding numerous housing initiatives, including Housing First, which helps get people off the street and get the treatment they need, rural housing investment so that every city and town in our state can play a role in meeting these goals, and numerous other housing programs that are led by Maine Housing. Her interagency housing production needs study, which was published just this last fall, defined the challenge and opportunity facing our region and the entire state as we work to create 75,000 new homes statewide. We're grateful for the governor's leadership on housing and we're absolutely delighted that she can be here with us today. So let's offer her a second round of applause. Oh my gosh. I don't, I don't feel that tall. I don't know why, but thank you, Christina. And thank you for organizing this incredible conference and this group today, all eager to talk about housing needs of Maine. And I just want to catch up um, and talk about some things my administration has done. Work is never finished, of course, but we know that the lack of affordable housing has profound impacts on everything from our state's economy, workforce recruitment, worker retention, and I'm pleased to be here to be part of the conversation, this important conversation that you're having today about how to grow vibrant communities in southern Maine, avoiding sprawl, avoiding taking away our beautiful natural resources and fields and, and um, areas for recreation but also accommodating the needs of people uh, from large businesses to small, schools, families, the needs of our people to have safe, affordable shelters and housing. Let's start with some good news. By focusing our efforts on improving high-speed internet and good schools and safe communities and good paying jobs in a clean environment, this administration, I believe, has been attracting new families to our, st our state and strengthening our economy. Since the end of 2019, Maine's GDP, gross domestic product, has increased by 9.2%. The best rate of growth in New England and one of the highest in the nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yay, GDP. Uh, from 2020 to 2023, our population grew by 2.4%. That sounds like a small number, but. I'm waiting for the day, any day now, when I can announce that Maine's population is 1.4 instead of 1.395. <laughs> but our population growth has been twice the national, national rate and eight times the rate of population growth in New England. I know when I was a child growing up in Maine, the brain drain was the theme and everybody said, oh, you're gonna leave Maine, never come back, and a lot of my classmates did just that. But now, people are coming back. They see Maine as a safe, comfortable place to be and to work and, and raise a family. And through October of last year, more than 15,000 new businesses filed to begin operations in Maine, a thousand more than the same period in 2022. 
new businesses, new families, new people. Our economy is strong, and it's getting stronger every day. But you and, all, you and I both know that the biggest impediment to our economic growth is the lack of affordable housing for our growing workforce in particular. Bath Iron Works, Washburn and Dowdy, Bigelow Lab in East Booth Bay, Jackson Labs in Bar Harbor, they've all had a hard time hiring workers because employees can't find affordable housing. Some businesses are having to build their own workforce housing. If you go up to Saddleback, you'll see this beautiful new dorm. I mean, that was partly privately funded, and it's a great idea. Other businesses are having to do that, too. Play, find places for their people to stay. I'm like big dorms and um, apartment houses. I hear every day from people across the state of Maine about the challenges of housing, which is why this administration has worked with Maine Housing to determine the root causes of our housing shortage and to identify and address our housing needs. <clears throat> the report we jointly released last year shows that our state as a whole needs an estimated 84,000 homes and apartments, housing units by 2030, based on current uh, economic and population trends. Now we're not alone. The entire country is looking at about 3.8 million units of housing that we need, rent or for sale. In part because new, new housing construction slowed after the Great Recession. Why do they call it a Great Recession? It was a terrible time. The recession of 2008 and 9, and it never truly rebounded. That shortage, historic shortage, along with high interest rates right now, labor and supply chain issues in the last few years, have put safe, affordable housing out of reach for too many people, and contributing to homelessness and leading to many young families and uh, young people having to put their hard-earned money towards rent instead of mortgage and building equity in their residence. Well, while the problem is not unique to Maine, it is national, at least we here in Maine are doing something about it. In the short term, we're working with municipal and private organizations on emergency housing to keep people from sleeping on the streets especially during cold winter months, and reducing pressure on local budgets. To that end, my administration and the legislature created the Emergency Housing Relief Fund. Our previous $55 million investment in the fund is supporting more than 70 housing programs and 7,000 main people in need statewide. In the greater Portland area alone, that funding has resulted in new shelter beds for 450 people, transitional housing for 800 people, and permanent housing for 700 people. This is progress. In my supplemental budget, currently being heard by the Appropriations Committee, I proposed an additional 16 million for the Emergency Housing Relief Fund to make sure we continue to meet the emergency housing needs of Maine people and communities including low barrier shelters, three of which are located right here in Portland. In the long term, we focused on building permanent, affordable, and energy efficient housing for people. And we're doing that in two primary ways. <clears throat> first, we're strengthening the Housing First program to address people's needs, those who are experiencing chronic homelessness, many of whom are also dealing with acute mental illness or and or substance use disorder. In my previous budget, I included funding to expand the number of Housing First units with on-site wraparound services from 85 to about 500 statewide. There are now three Housing First programs right here in Portland, Houston Commons, Florence House, and Logan Place with other sites under development. <clears throat> Look, Housing First is a successful and cost-effective way to address chronic ho homelessness for people like Sarah, a domestic violence survivor who has been chronically unhoused for the past 22 years, who said that moving into a housing first property in Portland saved her life. At the same time, we're building our housing inventory, an action that will increase supply and reduce prices and result in good homes for Maine people. What else have we done? <clears throat> well, one of the very first actions I took as governor five years ago was to release the senior housing bond that had been held up for several years by my predecessor. 
and which had been overwhelmingly approved by Maine voters in 2015. So far, that bond alone has funded the construction of more than 400 more units of affordable housing for seniors. And I've visited some of those housing units uh, in this area, and they are beautiful. When seniors move into those housing units, they oftentimes give up their homes, sell their homes in the communities, which increases the inventory of housing for young families. I also signed legislation to allow Maine property owners to build uh, accessory dwelling units. I know that wasn't an easy sell, but it's one way to increase the inventory without encouraging sprawl, too. That change alone is creating more housing at the same time, and it's generating income for homeowners who rent out their units so they don't feel pressured to sell. I signed legislation as well to extend the Maine Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit, and that is a huge thing. I think that has encouraged uh, financing projects such as redevelopment of Lewiston's Continental Mill. Uh, they made, they're making 72 apartments out of that mill building. And it's a great example of how historic buildings in our state can be reborn as housing for future generations. Again, keeping people downtown more or less and limiting sprawl, because we do have this sense of place that we value as main people, what attracts people here in the first place and brings people back. I also signed legislation to create the Maine Affordable Housing Tax Credit the single largest investment in housing in Maine history. That program already has been used to preserve and build hundreds of affordable rental units from Portland to Lewiston to Freiburg to Skowhegan and places across the state. And I signed legislation to create the Affordable Home Ownership Program and the Rural, say this fast, 10 times fast, the Rural Affordable Rental Housing Program <laughs> Rural Affordable Rental Housing uh, through Maine Housing, I'm going to rename it, to incentivize private developers to build affordable homes to, for people to purchase and to rent. Separate, um, so the Affordable Home Ownership Program already has 180 homes in the pipeline. And in the supplemental budget, pending right now, I've proposed $10 million to bolster this program and in order to construct another 130 affordable units statewide. Separately, the Rural Rental Program has funded 106 new units of rental housing in rural communities across the state. Last October, I attended a groundbreaking for one of those projects in Madison. It's one that'll create 18 affordable apartments in downtown Madison with Timber HP, or Go Labs, expanding their operations and hiring as many as 120 people just down the road from that housing, uh, housing, those housing units at the former Madison Mill site, this housing project couldn't come at a better time. Last week, I was also pleased to sign legislation LD2209 to authorize Maine Housing to issue more bonds to finance affordable rental housing and mortgages for first-time home buyers in cities and rural communities for years to come. Thanks to this new law and a portion of the new funding provided in the biannual budget, I'm pleased to announce today that construction will start very soon on 105 new affordable rental units in Hollowell, Newcastle, Rockport, Rumford, Sanford, and Waterville. <laughs> Taken all together, my administration has authorized nearly $285 million in support to help the construction of more apartments and homes across Maine. These state and federal funds have resulted in more than 600 new residential units so far with more than 1,000 units under construction right now and more than 2,000 units in the pipeline. That's the highest number ever in Maine housing's history. So I'm proud of the progress we've made, but I know that municipalities need support as they navigate these new opportunities for housing development. 
the Housing Opportunity Program at DECD, Department of Economic and Community Development, can provide you with funding and technical assistance, I encourage community leaders to email housing.decd at maine.gov. You got this right. For more information about the support that's available to you in this area, in the coming weeks, my administration will also launch a new housing data portal, like hers, to support housing development across the state. And I ask community leaders here today to help us advance this work by sharing information about the housing units that have been created in your community. What are your needs? What are your goals? What are your actions? Things that will help us document trends and identify where gaps exist and target resources effectively. I read something recently that said, home wasn't built in a day. Well, I agree. Ultimately, we all want to provide and build permanent, affordable, comfortable housing, weather-resistant housing for all who need it and all who want to be in Maine. To do that, we've got to think outside the box no matter where you are. We can turn vacant office buildings into apartments, stores, restaurants, multi-purpose facilities, things that bring new life to downtowns. We can turn old schoolhouses and even courthouses into smaller, more manageable apartments for seniors to live in safely in the communities that they love. We can create apartment complexes with shared kitchens and other amenities so more single people and young couples working in Maine can find a nice place to live without paying an expensive, expensive monthly rent or mortgage. Adapting existing structures and doing long-term planning that it takes to create more comfortable, efficient, and affordable housing that also avoids sprawl and preserves that sense of place and that sense of community. That's one of the special things about Maine. That's what brings people to Maine and keeps young people here, wanting to stay here. We're engaged in that planning with so many dedicated partners, including many of you here today. We have to constantly assess the progress we're making and determine the best ways to target the resources we have to build more affordable housing in our state. And I just wanna thank you for everything you're doing and for the towns and people in the towns who question why there should be new projects in their neighborhoods, there is nothing to fear. We are all in this together. The whole state needs you to do your part too. We have got to work, it, work on this together. And I look forward to the time when we can tell every person who wants to live and work in Maine or wants to stay here, welcome home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.